Uh, for those of you who are brand new with us today, you're diving into the deep end with us. Um, sorry about that. We've been in a series. Um, we're calling it this cultural moment. It's been a challenging series. I, not just for me to teach, but I think for a lot of you to hear and just kind of walk through some of these issues. But uh, I think it's really important that we not continue to ignore some of the cultural issues that we are facing. God has called us to be separate. He's called us to be apart. And um, he has called us holy. We're a holy and chosen people. Um, and so we have to be apart from culture if we're going to have any influence on culture. We have to be set apart from it. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't heard the first couple of messages over the last two weeks, to go back and to listen to those messages, especially the first one. Uh, so much of it builds on itself. Um, it's building, uh, we're going to use a lot of the first message today in this um, sermon, in, this, in today's sermon. Um, if you uh, didn't know, we have all the sermons on podcast now. So if you're a podcast listener, you can go online, whatever your favorite podcast uh, platform is, and you can listen to sermons on on podcasts. So of course we have them on YouTube as well. So today's topic um, is homosexuality. And this is a lot closer to a lot of our homes than I think maybe some of the other issues. I know it is for my home, the Bernard family. Um, I heard last couple of weeks ago, I asked you to kind of share your stories with me. And I heard from so many of you who reached out and talked about how these, these are our, you know, people that we love dearly. These are our friends. These are our neighbors. These are our family members. Sometimes these are our kids, people whom we love really, really dearly. And we don't always know how to approach it. And today I, I want to give you at least some footing for, for part of that. Um, in some ways, I feel like this kind of feels like a little bit old news, like a lot of these things we've already been talking about for the last decade or more. Um, gay marriage passed and is, is a thing now. We see the media is already saturated. And so why, why are we talking about it now? It seems like we're almost a little bit late, but I think it's still important for us to discuss for this reason. Um, because it is so much the water that we swim in, which is a throwback to a couple of weeks ago, because it's so much the water that we swim in, the Christian apologetic or, or defense of a biblical view on marriage in general, but on homosexuality in particular, to me, it seems like it's grown very weak. That, that ability to defend it, to, to understand why we believe what we believe. Um, for those who are trying to maintain some sort of a biblical stance on these issues, it's getting harder and harder, not just because of the social pressure, which we know is, is immense, but also because of the confusion. There's just so many different voices that are trying to speak into this that our theology, our personal theology is just, in my opinion, just grown really frail. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest, I take responsibility for that because I don't think the church has done a great job in equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. I think we failed in those areas. So I want to try to help undo a little bit of that today. Um, I said last week, you know, if someone else, if we don't talk about it, someone else will. And someone else is really. There are so many different voices. Matter of fact, I got a couple of books up here that I'll be sharing with you. Um, different um, pro-gay theologians who will say things like, hey, you're, you're just reading the Bible incorrectly. They'll come out and say exactly that. We see so many churches and pastors and denominations who are abandoning a sort of a historic Christian view on this topic. It's like, wait a second, what do we really think here? What do we really believe about all of this? How do we understand it? And so again, my goal is to give us some, some footing, at least to start to establish, reestablish some footing. So, on your sermon notes, if you have those, I've given you a ton of information on there. Again, uh, I won't touch all of it, but I will talk about a lot of it. I want to just kind of start off at the very top with some of those definitions that I gave you. Again, uh, the, the L, the G, the B, the T, the Q, the plus in the LGBTQ plus acronym. We're going to be talking about the three first ones, L, the G, and the B. Um, these are references to someone's um, sexual orientation. And when I say sexual orientation, in case we're all kind of make sure we're all on the same page, I'm referring to who a person feels romantically or sexually attracted to. So the L stands for lesbian, and that is women who are attracted to women. The G stands stands for gay, which is men attracted to men, although that term has grown quite a bit. It's a lot broader than that. And the B is bisexual. That means people who are attracted to either or to both sexes. And so like in previous sermons, there's going to be a lot of information coming at you today, but I really want to make sure that I'm not just speaking to your heads today, that I'm also talking to your hearts. I think that's really important for us to make the transition. This isn't just an intellectual pursuit. It's a heart one, and I hope I can, I can kind of tap into that for most of us. We're going to start off with some 
some cultural assumptions, uh, the same things that we've done in the past, um, and uh, define this cultural moment a little bit, and then we'll get into what the Bible has to say about this. But we're going to start by continuing to talk about identity. Uh, we talked about identity for the last couple of weeks because it is such an important piece of this whole conversation Um, As you listen to culture, you're going to hear these kind of mantras or these ideas or these phrases repeated over and over and over again. And they're they're spoken often enough that they have snuck their way into a lot of our thinking. And you'll see that even as I say some of these things, you go, oh yeah, isn't that true? I mean, it seems like it's kind of true because because it sneaks into our thinking, but we got to stop and kind of question the script a little bit. Um, So one of the things that you'll hear this seems to be just a given for a lot of people, it's number one on your outline, is that your sexuality is your identity. Now, uh, you know, we, we often talk about people, we say, oh, that person, not that they do homosexual things, but that they are a homosexual. And that's a little, it's a little tiny tweak, but it's really interesting to see how that plays itself out, that our sexuality is tied into our, our identity. This is a relatively new idea. Traditionally, sexuality has referred to an act, not an identity. Like, oh, that's, that's who I am. That's who I am. So when you start to think about that, it, it has ramifications. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of people today um, by way of some of the things that they've written. The first thing is uh, a woman by the name of Rosaria Butterfield who wrote an incredible book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And she tells her story in uh, this book. Um, she was a lesbian professor at Syracuse University. She taught women's studies. Um, she was an activist, very much so, very uh, kind of a hardcore activist. And uh, she was very content in her lesbian lifestyle. She had a partner. She was living in New York um, and uh, very content until she met a Presbyterian pastor by the name of Ken Smith. And over a couple years of friendship with Ken Smith and his wife, um, they kept inviting her into their home. Um, Rosaria Butterfield was confronted with the truth of Jesus. And eventually she had to come to terms with that. And uh, she eventually uh, gave her life over to Jesus. Now she's a, she's a wife. Um, she's a wife of a pastor, actually. She's a mother of four kids. She's um, a homemaker and author. And this is an incredible book if you ever get a chance to read it. Um, the Gospel Comes with a House Key. So here's what she says. She since, says, since Obergefell, Obergefell is the decision in 2015 to legalize gay marriage, okay? So she says, since Obergefell, the gospel has been on a collision course with the idea that gay is who you are and perhaps not how you are. This idea that who you are is better found in your sexual desires than in your image bearing of a holy God has been brewing under the surface since the 19th century when Freud first introduced the cultural idea of sexual orientation. This conflict has now exploded into the world. So today, when someone comes out as, as homosexual or gay, it, it's no longer just an action that they do. It's now, it's now who they are. They're, they're, they're finally found their, their authentic self, and they found it in the way that they express themselves sexually. And so for us, for anybody else to kind of question that about them is offensive because we're, we're not just questioning what someone does. We're actually questioning their identity, like who they are at their core. The, the mantra that kept, keeps repeated, oh, being repeated over and over is that this is who you are. This is who you are. This is your identity. This is your identity. And you're going to find the most fulfillment in your life by openly affirming that your homosexuality is your identity. This is a very, it's kind of subtle, but it's a very persuasive and compelling narrative. But again, kind of like last week, we just need to question the script. We need to question the narrative. Since when has our sexuality been our identity? Well, I'll tell you when it became our identity first. It became our identity when we no longer found our identity in God. So we had to find our identity in something else. Uh, Remember, we've talked about Imago Dei, the image of God, that each one of us was created in the image of God. John Stone Street said, God made us in his image. We can only know ourselves if we know God. Without God, we no longer know who we are. We no longer know who we are. So without our identity in God, even our sexuality could become our identity. Oh, that's, that's who I am. And that idea actually has consequences. It has pretty big consequences. I'm going to tell you about one of them. One of them is that by tying our sexual orientation to our identity, it suddenly becomes untouchable. 
Like you can't mess with that. You can't mess with somebody's identity. That's, not, that's, that's who you are. And you, you have to act, right? You have to act in line with your identity. So no one can talk about that with you. No one can touch that about you. You can't even touch that about yourself. If you come out as gay and then uh, somebody says somehow, some way, somebody gets a hold of you and then you're, you start to see things differently, boy, you really are questioned for, are you repressing your true self? Are you shutting your true self down? There's something fundamental about yourself that you are starting to repress or to push down and you're doing it because culture is telling you to do it. The script is that your identity is in your sexuality. So for those of us, and there are a lot of us, I think in the church, who have uh, gay loved ones who are really, really close to us, who, whom we love, oftentimes we will find ourselves kind of being stiff-armed out of, their, out of the picture, right? Um, they don't want to talk to us about it. They don't want to hear about it. Um, someone in my life who just doesn't speak to me anymore because he knows what I believe. And uh, the, the, the reason for that, I really think the deep set reason for that is because, um, because they have come to believe it's not just something they do, but it's like who they are. Well, this is who I am. And so there's, there's something very personal, personal about anybody who speaks uh, against that because t- culture has tied their sexuality to their identity and now it has become this powerful link that most people are not really willing to sever because they don't want to be untrue to, them, to themselves. But it has not always been that way. It has not always been that way. In fact, that leads us to another really powerful cultural assumption, something you've probably heard several times, um, and that is just that I was born this way. Like, it's so much a part of who I am. Like, this is how God created me. He made me this way. For decades, scientists have been looking, they're trying to find some sort of biological genetic link to homosexuality, to same-sex attraction, um, but they have never been able to to do that. And I think the reason that they have fought so hard to be able to do this, and this is, I'm not trying to be snarky with this. I'm just saying, I think the reason that they have fought so hard to be able to do this is because in essence, if they can blame God for their homosexual attraction, well, then the logic is if you created me this way, then how could it possibly be wrong? If God, if you're the one who's responsible for this, then how could this possibly be a problem? Right. Um, another person I'll introduce you to, his name is Christopher Yuan. Um, he wrote a book called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, a couple of different books, actually. Um, another amazing story of God just grabbing a hold of somebody. But um, Christopher Yuan was a, a visitor and a frequenter of some of those bathhouses in the, remember the 80s and the 90s when those, the gay bathhouse scene really took off and there was a lot of drugs and sharing of needles and homosexuality in those places. And so the AIDS epidemic kind of started to really find some footing there. Um, he was a part of that whole scene. As a matter of fact, he was a dealer, a drug dealer in that scene. And um, eventually he gets arrested for it. Um, he goes to federal prison, spends some time in federal prison and um, finds a Gideon Bible in the trash can that somebody had thrown away. And through that, you can read the story. It is just an amazing story. Through that, God gets a hold of his life. And um, now he's currently a professor at Moody Bible Institute and uh, has just written some incredible stuff and speaking to people's hearts about um, kind of coming out of that identity that culture has put onto them. Anyway, it's incredible. But here's what he says. Um, Let me see here. He says, despite a lack of evidence, the belief persists that people are born gay and thus may conclude that same-sex sexual behavior is no less immoral than eye color, right? So so it it just doesn't seem right that God would hold somebody culpable or responsible for something that, that he wired them to be. Not just he wired them to do, but he wired them to be. So if we can have God responsible for this, well, then it, it can't possibly be wrong. Right? You think about, for those of you who are Lady Gaga fans in the room, anybody? Never mind, I won't ask. Um, I was born this way. You know, I'm beautiful in my own way because God makes no mistakes, is what she says in this song. I, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. Now, don't try to take that song and apply it to the transgender movement ideas from last week. That doesn't fit. Um, uh, there's a logical inconsistency there, but that's a different story. Um, but it sounds good, right? And oftentimes we buy it like, I was born this way. So it can't be wrong. 
Well, unless you start to kind of play that out to its logical conclusions, like um, there's a form of reasoning called reductio ad absurdum, that you keep reducing something more and more until it almost becomes absurd, just to kind of see where it leads. So let's just, um, let's just reduce that statement down to its most absurd. We say, does the fact that we were born with something excuse our actions? Does the fact that we were born with them excuse our actions? So, for example, we know um, that we have a, there's a predisposition. There's a predisposition to things like alcohol and, and to drug abuse, right? If, you, if your parents were alcoholic, the Mayo Clinic says that genes are responsible for at least 50% of the fact that you'll be an alcoholic as well. Um, depression is another trait that it has, has hereditary biological links. We in church, we talk about the sins of the father being passed down to their kids. So things like anger and racism and spousal abuse. Um, I can look, be honest, I can look at my own life. I was born as a red-blooded male, as red-blooded as anybody else in the room, right? I can think that because I am wired in a certain way, that God would excuse me when I would live those things out, right? But does the fact that I am wired in a certain way, does that release me from responsibility for the choices that I make? Right? Of course it does. Most of us would say it doesn't. There's a, J, there's a gay advocate named um, John Corvino. He says it doesn't even matter. He's promoting homosexuality. He says it doesn't even matter whether we were born this way. The fact is that there are plenty of genetically influenced traits that are undesirable, right? We all know that. We all know that from our own lives. Back to Christopher Yuan, he says... He says, innateness doesn't mean something is permissible. For being born a sinner doesn't make sin right. And we'll see how this extrapolates out to all of our sin, not just homosexuality. We must point people to a far more important claim that the Bible makes. Regardless of what was true or not true when you were born, Jesus said, you must be born again. Right? So I don't care if you're an alcoholic or you're a liar or you're a porn addict or whatever it is, you have to be born again. Sam Albury says, the desire for the things God has forbidden are a reflection of how sin has corrupted me, not how God made me. Jesus says in John 3, 3, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. See, yet again, what the Bible is doing is presenting us with an alternative narrative. It's saying, wait a second, it's not the, it doesn't matter the way that you were born. This is how we can all say that we found freedom in Jesus Christ, because it doesn't matter how we were born. I know I was born with this inclination. I know my dad did this to my mom. I know this happened in my, in my childhood, but those things don't matter because we've been born again, and that means we have been set free. We have been set free and now we are no longer slaves to sin. This applies to every single one of us. So now our sexuality isn't our identity. Our inclinations are not our identity. Our sin isn't our identity. Our identity is in the image of God. Imago Dei. We are new creations in Christ. It doesn't matter that we were born some way because we have been born uh, again. And the identity that was given to you by God says that you have power over your darkest inclination, over your darkest tendency or desire to sin. And culture didn't give you that power. And culture, therefore, cannot remove that power from you. It is a God-given right. For every one of us as children of God, sin may be what we do, but it is not who we are. That is a lie from our culture. That is a lie from Satan, who is telling us this is your identity. We say, wait a second. That is not my identity. My identity is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Um, which leads us to uh, a third kind of fi final cultural assumption. We'll spend a lot of time here. Um, and this is just something, man, you just hear this over and over and over again. And that is simply that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. And I'm telling you, there are so many things inside of me, like inside my, the dark parts of my heart, that wishes that was true going to say that. Um, but this idea is so pervasive. It is being sold to Christians. It is being sold to pastors. It's being sold to churches all over the world. It's being taught by pro-gay theologians. And I'll read from a couple of these guys. This is uh, Matthew Vines. He wrote a book called God and the Gay Christian. It's a very formative book in the gay community. They really latched onto this. It's, it's well written. Um, this one is called um, What the Bible Really Says About Homosexuality by Daniel Helminiak. Um, this is another book that I'll read from in just a second. What does the Bible really 
really teach about homosexuality. <laughs> I don't know why they couldn't choose a different title, but anyway, um, Kevin DeYoung wrote this book, and I'm just going to start with this. I'm just going to lay all of my cards right on the table, um, and uh, let the Bible say what the Bible says. Um, Daniel, I mean, uh, sorry, Kevin DeYoung says, let me be blunt. The Bible says nothing good about homosexual practice. That may sound like a harsh conclusion, but it's not all that controversial. As we have seen, even some revisionist scholars admit that wherever homosexual intercourse is mentioned in the scriptures, it is condemned. There is simply no positive case to be made from the Bible for homosexual behavior. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this with you, but I have to at least give you a rundown of the biblical position on homosexuality. You need to hear this, at least from me. You need to know this because over and over, our culture is trying to undercut it. It's trying to come along and say, wait a second, what you've always seen, what you've always heard is not true. And we're falling for it. The church is falling for it over and over again. I've listed some of these for you on your sermon notes. I'm only going to read a couple, um, but I just do not want there to be any ambiguity about what the Bible really says about homosexuality, okay? So I'm just going to read these straight up. Late Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. A lot of times people say, oh, that's the Old Testament. Levit- Who reads Leviticus anymore? You know, okay, move on from that. Um, so let's jump into the uh, New Testament. Uh, Romans chapter 1, right at the beginning of the book of Romans. Therefore, Paul writes, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchange the truth about God for a lie, listen to this, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, I could go on. I could read a lot more lists and different things where it is explicitly condemned, but um, I just want you to know that there is no ambiguity in the Bible. Now, that does not stop pro-gay theologians from making every attempt, like I said, to undercut, to undermine the scriptures. I'll read you one little section, Daniel Helminiak, what the Bible really says about homosexuality. Um, He says, uh, but an historical critical approach reads the Bible in its historical and cultural context. So what he's doing is taking everything that we just read and saying, hold on a second, that fit to a culture but it doesn't fit to this one. He says the, uh, this approach takes the Bible to mean as best as can be determined what its human authors intended to say in their own time and in their own way. Understood on its own terms, the Bible was not addressing our current questions about sexual ethics. The Bible does not condemn gay sex as we understand it today. Okay. You can see, I mean, you can go do your own research. You can read this book or you can read other books. You can kind of see how they they want to go through and just kind of dismiss all of the biblical passages that call homosexuality sin. They want to go through one by one by one and just tell us why what is written in the Bible is either not true, it doesn't apply to this culture, it doesn't say what you think it means, or it doesn't mean what it says. Okay, one of those things is done in all things. And listen, my my goal is not to stand in front of you and beat up a bunch of people with the Bible. My goal instead is to hold up the Bible. And this is becoming more and more controversial as we go along. My goal is to stand up in front of you and hold up the Bible as the inerrant word of God. That that's what this is. These are not, these are not my words. 
These are not my words. We have to believe that these are words that are coming down from God himself. A cultural worldview, we talked about this in the very beginning before we got into any of this because we had to be on the same page. A cultural worldview tells us that truth is whatever we want it to be, whatever we want to make of it, what we want it to be. I'm gonna read you another little section from this guy, Matthew Vines, God and the Gay Christian. Listen to what he says. This is interesting. He said, I had a couple or I had a second reason for losing confidence in the belief that same-sex relationships relationships are sinful. It no longer made sense to me, right? That's as far as he goes. That's my second reason for believing that the Bible doesn't say what, it think, what we think it says about homosexuality. It just doesn't make sense to me anymore. He goes on to say, um, and as we're about to see, the new information that we have about sexual orientation actually requires, in, in italics, requires us to reinterpret the scriptures no matter what stance we take on homosexual relationships, right? So, so here's what's happening. A cultural worldview tells you how, what do you want truth to be? What do you want it to be? And then we, let's just make it what you want it to be. A biblical worldview says the scriptures determine truth. I read a couple of weeks ago that Jesus meant what he said when he said in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you truly are my disciple and you will know the truth. And the truth, Jesus says, will set you free. The truth will set you free. Hopefully that sounds familiar. The Bible isn't subjective truth. It doesn't change from person to person, culture to culture, era to era. The Bible is true for all people at all times, even if it doesn't fit the times, even if the times go against the Bible. Listen, we're not here, I'm not here to force anyone to believe the Bible. If someone comes to me and says, man, Paul, I just don't want, I don't believe. I don't want a biblical worldview. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't really believe in Christianity. I don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. All that stuff. Hey, listen, you're, you're on, you, you got it. You, you, that is your prerogative. You, can, you have every right to do that. But what I don't think is right is to take our understanding of the world and try to squeeze the words of an infinite and holy God into our little paradigm to make it match the things that we think it should be. Like, I don't know, man, I'm just a simple guy standing up here just trying to be faithful. But I read these books and it feels like a whole lot of verbal, emotional, mental gymnastics to try to get God to say what I think to say what I want to believe, to force the Bible to come into line with our conclusions. And I get it. I feel that draw because I got people close to me too. You don't think I want to open the Bible and find ways to dismiss all that? The people who aren't talking to me right now because they can't stand that I have a different idea on this? You don't think that breaks my heart? I wish the Bible said something else. But who am I going to report to? Who am I going to come into line with? Is it going to be people in my culture? Is it going to be people who are going to come up against me? Remember, Jesus said he came to bring a sword. And this is one of the most painful times when that is happening. It is so true. He is going to bring a division between the people who are following him and the people who are not. That is a reality we are going to have to contend with. If I'm going to call myself faithful to God, I don't get to put my words in God's mouth. He does the opposite. We, James says, we submit ourselves therefore to God, not God to us. Otherwise, we make ourselves into God. And I don't know, again, just a simple guy, but that seems really dangerous to me. It does not seem like a place I want to be. People say all over the internet, you read, just get online and do a search for pro-gay theology or anything like that. And you'll see over and over, hey, Jesus didn't say anything about it, so neither should you, right? There's not a bad point. Jesus didn't specifically talk about homosexuality um, any of his time that he was here, um, but he also didn't talk about um, slavery, pedophilia, killing children, spousal abuse, torture, sex trafficking, to name a few of those things. But that's just because Jesus didn't mention those things doesn't mean he wasn't opposed to those things. Of course he was. What Jesus did do in his time here was very clearly reaffirm the biblical view of marriage. Remember the Pharisees come up to him in Matthew 19. They start to kind of push him. They start to test him on it. They say, what what about divorce? What about divorce? And Jesus turns back to him. He says, haven't you read? He says, haven't you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? Jesus didn't have to give some kind of special sermon on homosexuality because he affirmed what everyone else already knew, that the covenant union between a man and a woman was the normative expression of sexuality. 
That was the way that God had designed it from the very beginning. And every other form of sexual expression that was outside of that was prohibited in the Bible. Jesus affirmed that. Matthew chapter 15, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. That sexual immorality is a broad term in Greek. It's the word pornea. It's where we get our word pornography from. And it included all sorts of sexual sin that Jesus is saying, this stuff is coming out of the wrong place. This is not good. Um, It includes bestiality, adultery, prostitution, infidelity, fornication, and yeah, homosexuality was in that list too. Um, when I first heard this guy, Christopher Yuan, I heard it on a podcast that I was listening to. And um, in one of his other books, matter of fact, it's his autobiography. It's called Out of a Far Country. It's where he tells the story of going to prison and finding the Bible in the trash can and all those such things. He said something in that podcast that caught my attention. I'm going to read it to you. He said, um, I had always thought that the opposite of homosexuality was heterosexuality. But actually, the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. All Christians are called to holiness, no matter what their sexual feelings. My newfound identity in Christ compelled me to live in obedience to God rather than to my temptations. Biblical change is not the absence of struggles, but the freedom to choose holiness in the midst of the struggles. The opposite of homosexuality is holiness. So listen, I'm going to kind of turn the tide here a little bit because I've been speaking the truth, I think, from the word of God to the homosexual question. Okay, so we we got that. But I don't want to just leave it there because if I'm going to speak the truth of the word of God, I'm going to speak it in its entirety right? So we have to deal with something too as the church and how we, we deal with this sin. How do we respond to it? How do we react to people who might come into our midst, who might be in our midst right now? Um, one is to stand on truth and the other is to stand on grace. And it is always both and, okay? Here's where the grace component is going to come in. The grace component is going to come in when we start to take an honest look at our sin, our sin even within the heterosexual community, right? Um, Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, right? You know this verse, Um, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Now, I'm singling out homosexuality today and transgenderism last week and abortion next week because a couple of things. First of all, like I said earlier, I believe our biblical understanding really needs to be shored up. We really need to, to really understand what we're standing on. And the second reason is because it's just in our face all the time, right? It's just so much a part of culture and everything that we see. And there is such a strong push, a such strong, strong movement to convince us that homosexuality in particular is not sin. But we have to acknowledge that for every type of sexual sin, not just homosexuality, holiness is the answer. For every single type of sexual sin, sexual brokenness in all of its forms is rampant in our culture, is rampant even in the church. It's not just homosexuality. The number of Christian men who are addicted to pornography right now The number of couples who are sleeping together before they get married, the number of men and women who are unfaithful to their spouses, the opposite of all that sexual brokenness is the same. It is holiness. And that is not just something that gay people need to pursue. This applies to every believer, every person who calls on the name of Jesus Christ, recognizing our own need for holiness, which is something, man, if we forget that, if we forget that we too are fallen people in need of salvation by grace, if we forget that, what we start to do is we start to get ourselves up on a pedestal and look down on everybody else's sin. We start to look down on people and say, oh, you know what? Your sin is worse than my sin. And none of us have a right to say that according to the Bible. We are all on the same footing. We recognize that our need for holiness applies to every single one of us in this room. We all have that need. And remember, it isn't a battle against flesh and blood. It is a battle against the spiritual powers of darkness that are over this world, right? So we have to remember that. No one gets to say your sin is worse than my sin. The church needs to get off its pedestal. And when we start to pick and choose certain sins that are worse than other people's sins, Every sin, all sin is a distortion of the image of God in us. Amen? It is a distortion of that. So I don't care if you're gay or you're trans or you're, you're having sex with women in your mind. We all need holiness. Amen? Every single one of us. 
The temptation for some people to pursue homosexuality is real and it is powerful. We have to stop acting like the, 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 those people just need to get over it. It's not like that. It's not that way. I've read stories about people who spent year upon year upon year praying that God would free them from that temptation. It kind of reminds me of some of the men that I've talked to who are praying for God to remove the sexual addiction that you have in your life with pornography. We need to applaud and uphold those who are same-sex attracted, but who are single and pursuing holiness through celibacy. As a matter of fact, I've just met two people in the last couple of weeks who are in our community who are doing that exact thing. And the church needs to be the place where they're at so that we can all come together. We can find out that we're all struggling with sin together and we can all find mutual support and encouragement and not condemnation. None of us needs that. We need to be welcomed into a Christian community so that we can help each other pursue holiness. So we need to encourage our young people. I think that marriage is not the only path to righteousness. You know, Paul comes along and says, I wish that all of you could be single like I am, like, like Jesus was. I think the church needs to take special care uh, not to create a sense of blame or shame on people who feel tempted to things like this because the temptation is not the sin. Jesus himself was tempted in every way that we are, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. God wants people to come to know their true identity in him. And the best way for them to do that is to be a part of the people of God so that they would come to know who they really are, that they would come to know that we all have a mutual struggle with sin and with brokenness and that they're not alone with that. I've read over and over how gay people will walk into a Christian community, come into a church, and they feel like first century lepers right off the bat. Like, oh, you're untouchable. Get out of here. We don't want anything. I, I, let me pause here. I do want to say that this church, in fact, every church I've ever been involved in, Lake Eminem Community Church, I have never seen, matter of fact, I've seen the exact opposite. I have never seen a gay person treated cruelly in this place. I think that's a media caricature that they want people to believe. I don't think that's how we actually treat people. I think we're amazing. But if you did, if you started to treat them and to shun them in a different way, I would have a very serious conversation with you. And I would ask you the question, do you really believe that God is the answer or not? If you believe it, then why in the world are you pushing people out of that? Why in the world are you pushing people away from God? The church is supposed to be a place for broken people. We all need grace, every single one of us. And so we have to figure out, do we, do we back down on the truth and try to water down the word of God and say, oh no, it's not that big of a deal. It's not sin. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But are we gonna be there to help people walk through their sin? We better be. We better because that's what Jesus did. He came to seek and to save the lost. The lost. That's what he calls us to do too. To seek and to save, to bring people into a relationship with him. But when they come here, the church is also a place of repentant sinners. That we have understood the gospel leads us to repentance. To, to say anything else is to preach a different gospel, honestly. Um, we're not doing anyone a favor by watering down the word of God. We're deceiving people's souls by doing that. Um, God doesn't change with the tides of culture and neither do we. So we stand on his truth. We listen to his word. It is full of, Jesus came full of grace and truth. And we are gonna do both every time. It's always both and, amen? I'm gonna let uh, Rosaria Butterfield kind of wrap us up today and then we'll go back to Romans 12. This is the very end of her book. In the conclusion, she has a little section called What If? She just paints a picture of a world that is possible should we, um, should we all kind of come into an understanding of who we are in Christ. And she just keeps asking, what if? Well, well, just imagine if. So let me just read this to you. She says, imagine a world where living as image bearers of a holy God meant something something that changed the way we saw ourselves and others. Imagine a world where the fruit of repentance and the practice of hospitality marked the reputation of Christians for those who do not yet believe that Jesus saves. Imagine a world where no one languishes in crushing loneliness, where no abused woman or man or child suffers alone, where people take their real and pressing problems to Christians who have the reputation of being helpers and where victims are not swept away, lost, forgotten. Imagine a world where people fear God more than men 
and serve God more than comfort. Imagine a world where the power of the gospel to change lives is ours to behold. This is the world that the Bible imagines for us. This is the world that Jesus prays for us to create in his name. We do these things so that we can prepare arm in arm for what is coming next, for the return of Christ, for our inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth, so that we can warn our neighbors of the real judgment to come, and so that we can honor our God and King. That is the nuts and bolts of it, yes? Starting with you and me and our open door. This is not complex, radically ordinary. Daily Christianity is not PhD Christianity. Start anywhere, start somewhere, but do start. Amen? Paul says, Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, God, I just pray for my own life and for the life of this Christian community. God, that we would not be conformed to this world, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Your Holy Spirit comes in, God, and does a work inside of us because you have called us to be a light, a beacon, city on a hill in this culture so that as they get caught up and mired down in all of the stuff that's swirling around, God, they would look out and they would be able to see somebody, something that's standing apart. I pray, God, that this church in particular, but every church in the valley or in the, in the continent would be, a, would be a city on a hill, would be a beacon of light for people who are lost. God, I'm going to challenge you to please bring them to us so that we might love them into your kingdom. God, I would ask that you would prepare each and every one of our hearts for just conversations and ways of thinking about this. We know the truth. We stand on the truth. We know grace. We stand on grace. And I pray that we would be able to find a balance in all of our lives. We thank you for dying for our sin because every one of us needs it. Lord, we give this whole thing over to you. We ask that you would bless it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right.